Okay. Uh, so we initially had five panelists. Unfortunately, John Carr is unable to join us today. Uh, he lost power. We do have four wonderful panelists for you today. We have Dr. Cheryl Betagoli from the city's Department of Public Health. Cheryl, would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, Cheryl, you're on. There we go. Yes. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Yes, I'm Cheryl Bedigal. I'm one of the physicians with the City Health Department and have been part of the COVID-19 response team. So it's a pleasure to be with you all today, and I'll be happy to answer your questions along with the other panelists. Thank you. Uh, we also have Nancy Van Dolsen from Cliveden with us today. Nancy, would you like to introduce yourself? I can't hear Nancy. Sorry, Nancy, could you repeat yourself? We could sure. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm Nancy Van Dolsen. I am the CEO of Cliveden of the National Trust. Uh, I've been here one year, so it's been quite a year. <laughs> um, uh, Cliveden is a National Historic Landmark um, built in 1767 as a country house for um, Benjamin Chu and his family, and it was mostly built as a response to the frequent uh, yellow fever epidemics. So we are also, uh, our earliest history is related to a pandemic. Um, the uh, property is um, owned by the National Trust and we are a co-stewardship uh, property of the National Trust, but we're a private nonprofit. So for example, they don't give us operating, we come up with the operating ourselves. So thanks again for having us here today. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we also have Beth Beatty from Fort Mifflin, which is also a National Historic Landmark. Beth, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, I've been um, executive director here at Fort Mifflin um, about nine years. And during that time, there has been uh, multiple hurricanes, frequent flooding, an earthquake, um, a pandemic now. Um, I would not be surprised to see a plague of locusts. Uh, we've got plenty of the spotted lanternflies. So we deal with um, sort of disasters outside of our control, unfortunately, on a pretty regular basis. The fort was actually built on a small spit of land called Mud Island in the Delaware River. It's all now connected to the mainland, but um, as the name indicates, uh, we have like frequent water issues. So we're, we're used to kind of figuring it out as we go. Thank you for joining us. Um, we also have Gwen Ragsdale from the Lest We Forget Museum of Slavery. Uh, Gwen's video is not working, but she is here with us and her audio is working. So Gwen, can you introduce yourself? Sure, can you hear me okay? Sure can. Again, my name is Gwen Ragsdale. I'm the executive director of the Lest We Forget Slavery Museum. We are the only museum of slavery in Philadelphia and the only museum with actual slavery artifacts which my husband, J. Justin Ragsdale, has been collecting for the past 60 years. We have actual items used during the transatlantic slave trade, iron objects such as slave shackles, manacles, branding irons, and other forms of ironware that were used on enslaved Africans. The ability to be able to see these items really makes you understand how different coming to America was for enslaved Africans. So I'm glad to be a part of this discussion and I look forward to uh, a good discussion. Thanks, Gwen. Um, so as I said, John Carr is not uh, able to join us, um, but hopefully we'll, he will have some information and resources to share post this meeting with all uh, everyone who registered. Um, so I'm gonna start off by asking each of the panelists some prepared questions. Uh, and I'd like to start with uh, Dr. Betta Gold. Uh, what are some of the guidelines that site managers, historic site managers and museums need to consider in keeping both visitors and their staff safe? So, so thank you for that question. And, and thank you all, because I know that, you know, keeping Philadelphia safe is something that we're all doing jointly and that you've all probably put a lot of time already into thinking about how to do this. It, we've posted uh, guidance for a whole variety of sectors on a website, phila.gov slash reopening. And what I'm gonna talk through with you very briefly is the framework that we've used for all of those documents. Um, we know that not every site fits into one of the categories we've thought of, but the same principles really apply. So the safety checklist has uh, eight elements on it. 
and they are masks, barriers, isolation and quarantine, distance, reducing crowds, hand washing, cleaning and communication. And so just very briefly, what we mean by those masks, of course, we all I think are familiar at this point, meaning not just people who are working at a site are wearing a mask, but everybody who enters is wearing a mask. My mask protects you, your mask protects me. If we're both masked, that's our maximum protection. Barriers um, are useful, often they're plexiglass or plastic barriers, useful for somebody who is in a position where they're gonna have a lot of contact with the public. Somebody at an information desk, a cashier, where people are not necessarily gonna be able to be six feet away. Isolation and quarantine refers to the fact that if somebody is sick or they've been exposed to somebody who is sick with COVID, they need to be home, they need to be away from other people. So thinking about sick leave policies, thinking about how are you going to notify people if they have been exposed and make sure that people who have been exposed to COVID and those with symptoms aren't coming to your site where people can get exposed. Distance, I think we've all heard now, keeping six feet from others. Easy to say, um, thinking about ways to remind people to do it, things like stickers on the ground or using one-way directions for hallways, lots of ways to do this, but people need to be reminded. They forget constantly. Reducing crowds. Depending on the site, we may have limitations to the number of people we would allow in a site. We say in general, not more than 25 indoors or 50 outdoors, but that can change depending on how big that space is. Um, and I'm happy to talk about um, you know, how that might apply to different sites if you wanna talk about that in the question and answer session. Hand washing or using hand sanitizer just as much as possible. I think we all tend to touch our faces a lot and so the more we wash our hands, the greater the chance that we won't have something um, infectious on them if we do that. Cleaning, especially wiping down commonly touched surfaces like counters and doorknobs with disinfectant frequently. And then communicating. And this is in part about uh, educating staff. It's also about posting signage to remind people, you know, a sign that says don't come in here without a mask. And that reminds people that if they're sick, or if they've been exposed to somebody who was sick. And that's a piece people often forget, that they don't come inside. Signs in break areas, reminding staff that if they're going to take a break, they're gonna have a snack or something to drink, take that mask down, that they make sure they're at least six feet from everybody else before they do that. So that's kind of how we frame all this. And I think it's useful, um, especially if you're, you're at a site that doesn't fit into some very common category. Um, to think through how do those different principles apply to my site. And I'll put the website where our reopening guidance is um, into the chat so that you all have it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so my next question is uh, going to go one at a time to each of our site managers. Um, first with Nancy at Cliveden. Uh, Oh, I should mention that all three sites that are part of the panel today have been open to the public, so they have some experiences to share with everyone. Um, so first, Nancy at Cliveden, uh, what did you do to prepare to reopen and what have you learned so far in your experience? Well, we're not open. Uh, the house is not open. Uh, our grounds are open, though. So. Um, and that was, you know, a, an important consideration for us. Um, we uh, basically, um, throughout the pandemic, realized that there really are three areas that we needed to be concerned with, right? Health and safety, obviously. Um, but the fact that our house probably would not be open immediately because we are in the middle of a reinstallation. Um, a lot of things were postponed because we had a lot of um, projects that were gonna be done in the house that couldn't be done uh, when we were closed. Um, so we're gonna be opening up uh, in late August. So. Um, so not being open the house, we wanted to make sure that we were able to reach uh, the public. Uh, we were able to open our grounds July 4th when historic sites were able to be open. Um, we have five acres here uh, and two buildings. And so we uh, decided that we would put up signage that we hadn't had about the property and the houses and the barn on the property for people to be able to read while they were here so that there was some still educational component before there was no signage whatsoever. 
Um, we also put out signs about safety. So that wear a mask six feet, et cetera. So we, you know, we, we cover those bases as well on the property. We also put up a uh, Black Lives Matter exhibit um, on the exterior of the fence on our right next to our entrance. Um, Clifton has been um, very involved in uh, exploring and learning about the uh, enslaved and the free blacks that worked here on the property. So we have that information already and so we uh, transformed that into an outside exhibit. So again, while we weren't open, we were able to reach the public. And then we went digital, um, like so many other historic sites uh, have. Uh, we received a grant from the Pennsylvania Humanities Council as well as from Compass to help us with that. We did not have much of a digital presence. We still really don't, we're working on it. But that first exhibit that will be opening on April, I mean, in August 19th, uh, which is the women of Cliveden, um, preserving and adapting their world, that will go digital first and then we will um, begin to do tours in which there will be scheduled tours um, with uh, a small number of people that will uh, sign up ahead of time um, once a week, as well as doing Zoom tours. So we'll be doing sort of a combined um, methodology for a while. Mm -hmm. So our, our major concerns were um, health, safety, and getting our word out that we're still here, we're still active, and that we wanna reach the public with our message. Thank you. Are you limiting uh, the number of people per tour group? We will do um, a maximum of eight. Uh, we do have fairly large spaces um, and we're still in the process of trying to decide since there's this new installation, uh, so the house is totally different, whether or not we will have someone who is um, basically stationed there and just sort of making sure directing traffic to make sure that nobody, we don't get all eight in one room at a time um, to keep them separate. Uh, so that will be another consideration rather than having our sort of standard guided tour. So we'd have someone outside who would explain, they'd go into the house and they'd make sure that people were socially distanced while they were there, of course, and had their masks on. Great. Um, have you done anything uh, to prepare yet for the cleaning of artifacts and historic art, uh, objects in your, in, inside the building? We've decided that the way we're going to deal with it is isolation and most uh, people say seven to ten days so we'll have a day of people being in the building um, hopefully not touching we'll try to make sure nobody should be touching anyway right <laughs> um, but people will touch the banisters they go up the stairs um, and making sure that uh, you know they, they touch as little as possible and then we'll just wait a week before we have another group in um, we really feel like uh, we don't want to be using any kind of harsher chemicals, um, sanitizers, or anything on even the historic uh, banister, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I have the same question for Beth at uh, Fort Mifflin. Fort Mifflin's grounds has also been open for quite some time now. Uh, Beth, can you share what you've been doing uh, to prepare to reopen, what experience you've experiences you've had so far with being open to the public? We reopened sort of on the leading edge of this um, at the end of May. We have ex over 40 acres, uh, about 30 of which are accessible. So we really opened um, like a park. The uh, site itself is enclosed with the fence. So we were able to capture the admission dollars for this. Um, but we were doing really no interpretation, no programming. It was really just the outdoor space. So in advance of that, um, the board convened, we adopted a protocol based on some guidelines from the National Park Service, the CDC, and it was all translated by um, a, a board member who was a nurse. So she was able to kind of um, really just make it understandable for everyone. We decided how we would approach all of this. We'd have uh, extensive signage. There's a sign when you enter the site. There are lawn signs throughout the site to remind people to stay home if you're sick, wear a mask for any interaction, um, practice social distancing. And um, it, was, it was really, it, it could not have gone smoother. I've been really pleased with our experience overall during this process. Uh, of course, one of our 
things that we do is we do a lot of black powder demonstrations, which we can do from a significant distance. Um, so you can hear it throughout the site. So we were able to sort of engage in that way, um, even when we were really not doing any programming. We also, in order to make it um, the visitor perception that it was worthwhile to pay admission to come to what was functioning like a park, we did a no contact scavenger hunt that by touring through the site, reading interpretive signage, reading the admissions brochure, um, you were able to uh, engage in, in a certain way. So that was helpful. Uh, we've received nothing but positive feedback uh, for being open, for doing our programming. Uh, we've received a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities for moving all of our historic programming outdoors. So uh, we are extending shade. The fort doesn't really have a lot of trees. So we have invested in some tents and some, some tarps. And we are bringing our historic programming outdoors at a safe social distance. So I, I have to say that our visitors mirror our staff behavior. We're all wearing masks. So when a visitor comes up, we're taking admission right from the visitor's car they put a mask on and we have had not a single issue or incident of anyone behaving inappropriately or anyone being angry when they're told to please put a mask on. You know, we have been um, really just pleasantly surprised at the consistency of compliance among our visiting public. Good to know. Um, I do have a question since you've put all of this effort into having all of your programming outside and you've been really successful with it. Do you have any plans coming up for when the weather changes and it's, um, and it's colder? We do actually. And we have had um, a couple of limited ticket events that we are allowing to happen inside. We did a civil war weekend. All of the general programming was outside, but we did have a special speaker who did a limited audience, socially distant presentation in an air conditioned space. So we are gradually allowing some access to the buildings, um, but like Clifton, uh, we are relying on that week in between um, so that we're really dealing with only normal cleaning and all of the high touch surfaces are being disinfected at the end of every shift. So um, we are gradually exploring that. One of the other lines of of revenue that we have is we do some paranormal programming and by its nature those groups are very small so um, luckily we've been able to re-engage with that but again it's it's over a week in between when we have opened up any of the structures. Got it. Um, and then finally Gwen, uh, can you tell us what you've been doing to prepare to reopen um, and especially since you have a lot more, I believe, indoor programming, if you've been doing anything special for cleaning. Well, all of our programming is indoor. We are a small uh, facility. Um, however, we, like everybody else, requires require a mask as well as uh, social distancing. Um, now, in terms of social distancing, Nancy will probably laugh because she knows how small we are. I actually put a red, tape down the middle of um, our floors and I uh, tell my guests um, that when we have we have uh, guided tours and I tell my guests when I move to one side then they can move to the other side and vice versa and uh, like the other uh, uh, guest said we haven't had any problems with anybody uh, complying uh, with our requirements people uh, come to the come to the door with their mask already on um, in terms of cleaning we you know, wipe down our chairs. There's no touching of anything. Um, and we don't uh, clean our uh, uh, artifacts because we just uh, aren't comfortable with putting any uh, chemicals or anything on our historic uh, our, our artifacts because we don't know what it would do to the, uh, you know, to the uh, elements or the patina of these, of these objects. But um, we've, we've uh, uh, opened up actually uh, almost, uh, we were kind of forced to open up. We, hadn't opened up, Philly had just turned green, but we were getting constant calls from uh, people who wanted to know if we were open and, you know, and if they could make appointments because you'd have to schedule an appointment to visit us. And uh, um, so people were constantly calling and or booking tours on our website, which allowed them to do that. 
and then I would have to call and tell them that we weren't open yet. But uh, now that we've opened, we've uh, uh, allowed just small groups, groups of uh, five to eight. We've never done anything over eight, uh, even though we had one group that wanted to come this group of 10. And I stood firm and told them that we're, we're just going to keep it low for now. Um, so again, we're open with moderation, um, open with you know all of the elements that, that are required to, to stay safe not only for ourselves, but specifically for our visitors. And there was a, there was, was there another question that you asked in there that I didn't? Uh... Um, you touched on it a little bit. I was wondering if um, we've had questions about cleaning products uh, mm -hmm. and a lot of historic sites are, you know, obviously concerned about increased need for cleaning, how that, if there's any specific products or advice that anybody would have for them. Well, quite frankly, I use, uh, we have metal chairs and I use Clorox, Clorox wipes on those chairs. Just give them a good wipe down, you know, um, the start of every tour at the end of the evening, at the end of the tour as well. And um, that, that works well for us. And sometimes we'll, we'll also wipe down the uh, areas where people could touch, not the, 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 the uh, artifacts themselves, but sometimes they put their hands on the shelving where we have artifacts. So we wipe those down as well. So we're very conscientious of uh, keeping our uh, facility as safe and clean as possible. Got it. And the EPA actually has a list of products that you can use that are approved for um, preventing COVID on their site. Um, and I'll, I'll put a link to our page where, where there's information about how to do this. We also have information posted about how to make a bleach solution yourself. Um, basically a third of a cup of bleach and a gallon of water. Um, but it's it's just useful to kind of have the guidelines there. So I'll put those up. Good to know. Thank you. Um, so each of you touched on this a little bit. I'm gonna open this question up to anybody on the panel. Um, what would you advise for managing visitor behavior? Specifically, how can sites communicate and enforce safe visitor behavior? It sounds like most of your experiences so far have been positive. Um, so would anybody like to touch on that a little bit more? We, I'll, I'll start. We have um, a sign right as you enter uh, that enumerates the expectations. And it starts out with welcome, um, but it says, you know, please stay home if you're sick, wear a mask for interactions. So, so they, like we set out the expectations right when people arrive on site. Um, and then there's reminder um, lawn signs throughout where we figured where the visitor will tip, how a visitor will typically experience the site. Um, so by communicating our expectations, people are not surprised then. Um, and, you know, we got the staff together in advance and went over, because I also want to make sure, uh, because we are all now engaging in some level of public uh, interaction, I wanted to make sure that the staff felt comfortable with the measures that we're taking and that they are going to be compliant from their own perspective about, um, you know, not reporting to work if they're not feeling well, uh, wearing a mask for public interactions and stuff like that. So we have kind of walked into this and we're not a site because of the, the expansive grounds. Even if there were, you know, uh, if we got lucky and we got 200 visitors in one day, it would still not feel crowded. Um, visitation is down from previous years. So I wanna say probably our busiest days maybe been about 120 people over the six hours that we are open. So um, it really is never crowded. Yeah, you also mentioned, and this sounds like great advice for everyone, that just really making sure that your staff understands uh, their expectations and that they're modeling good behavior to the visitors. Um, I think you mentioned that visitors seem to, to look to them, to the staff. Oh, absolutely. And, and I have felt um, that it was important for me to sort of take the temperature, so to speak, of, you know, our visitors. How are they feeling? What is the vibe? What is the mood? And so I have been actually at the front gate on, on numerous Saturdays and um, 
car approaches. I've got my mask on, they mask up. I mean, really people are mirroring um, your behavior. And it, if it's clear, like on our website, like what we're doing, uh, I actually had someone reach out on Facebook if masks were required for uh, being uh, a ticketed paranormal investigation. I'm like, well, if you wanna go in the building, yes. Yes, you do have to wear a mask. So I don't know whether that person actually bought a ticket or not, but you know, I'm not gonna apologize for um, keeping my staff safe and the other visitors. Um, did anybody else have anything they would like to say about managing visitor behavior? I'd just like to say that I am uh, very glad that I live and work in the Northeast area where people have seemed to have just accepted the fact that we must wear masks, we must social distance, we must uh, wash our hands. It just seems like it's a uh, commonplace now. You know, but I hear on the news where you have other parts of the uh, state where people are actually resisting doing those uh, minor things. And, and it just befuddles my mind. I mean, you know, uh, it, it, in the same way that people resisted using seatbelts when that law was uh, first uh, uh, introduced. So I, I have not had any issues, no questions asked. Every visitor, uh, anybody that has even uh, uh, um, uh, come knocked on the door and asked if we were open, they have masks on. So I, again, I, I just think it has a lot to do with living and working in this area where people has just have just accepted the fact that we have to wear masks and we have to social distance. Okay, thank you. I also wanna point out that there's been some really great suggestions from people in chat, specifically about uh, approved cleaners and recommendations. So I encourage people to take a take a look at that. Um, and we will be compiling some information and resources to send to everyone after this panel. So we can include that information as well. Um, so this is also a question directed to any of our panelists right now. Uh, some of this was already mentioned a little bit. Um, what should sites know about the costs of reopening safely? Um, there might be additional costs related to cleaning, to PPE for staff or visitors. Um, also, uh, if there is a concern about staff members being exposed, um, connecting them to testing, uh, any of those costs, any that I'm not even thinking of right now that uh, visitors should be aware of. And then secondly, uh, do you have any suggestions for financial assistance or low cost resources? Cheryl, I don't know if you're aware um, or, or would recommend anything specifically um, through the Department of Health and what you're familiar with. No, I don't know of specific resources in terms of, I mean, it depends obviously on the cost and I think we all have heard about the PPP loans and so on. Um, but for Supplies, I don't know of costs, but, 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 you know, cleaners, because making your own bleach uh, solution is a very low cost approach to that, that's one idea. Um, I would suggest that, especially if you're dealing with historical objects, the option to set things aside for four days is one that we suggest, um, rather than putting cleaning solutions that might be damaging on them. So if that's an option for you, um, that's going to be the safest and simplest thing. Um, but you know, there's no doubt that there are, there's cost, but there's also impact on revenue. If you usually have a hundred visitors a day and now you only have 20, obviously that's, that's a very significant cost. Um, yeah, I, you know, it, I um, will say that there has been work on the city side in terms of economic support. Um, it's not happening through the health department. So I would look at the, um, the city sites and um, while, while other panelists are answering, I can, I can see if I can pull a site and put it into the chat for you. Okay. I, I would just like to say that there, there's also another cost. And one reason that we're not opening as early as we would like is that we had to get our restrooms in a manner in which we felt that it was safe for people. Uh, our carriage house where our restrooms are and visitor center are was built in 1972. And so there are multiple stalls in a very small area. There um, are vent fans that are not very good. There were no toilet seats. 
So we put on seats. Uh, tomorrow, the guy comes to upgrade all our ventilation fans uh, in those bathrooms, and we're making it one stall. We're locking all the other ones, so there's only one at a time. So, um, you know, there are those kinds of costs as well, and we're just eating that out of our our budget. So, um, but we felt the current conditions were not not good. So, um, you know, we are working on a much larger grant to redo the entire carriage house, but that won't be for a year or two. So we felt we needed to do this first, rather than saying to people, there are no restrooms available. So, um, and then the other costs, um, again, uh, there were a lot of COVID grants for uh, nonprofits and museums sort of earlier. Um, I don't know of any now that are coming up uh, that would cover these costs. But there were earlier grants from NEHPA, um, Pennsylvania Humanities Council, um, and a few other organizations that were covering some of those costs. Thank you. Uh, would anybody else like to speak to the costs of reopening and how they've been handling that? Um, we, we handled it pretty much the same way Clifton did in that we just uh, used part of our maintenance budget to um, we are actually using the low cost, you know, DIY bleach sanitizer. Um, we actually have a member on staff who has a fragrance allergy. So this is um, kind of what we've been doing all along to keep uh, her from having any kind of a reaction. Um, and we haven't found it to be overwhelmingly burdensome. We did, we have all have our um, special Fort Mifflin masks that look like the flag so that it's also a good way for visitors to identify someone who is on staff who might not be in period attire. Um, and we have uh, paper masks that we are happy to give out to anyone that might have forgotten their own. Thank you. Uh, Gwen, was there anything that you'd like to mention um, for the cost of reopening that you've experienced? Nothing major. Um, you know, we've been able to uh, manage um, the cost. We did um, a spring for a thermometer to take uh, people's temperatures as they entered the property. Um, but uh, um, other than that, you know, the, like I said, because we're so small, we, you know, don't have a lot to clean or to, uh, uh, you know, to, to take care of or sanitize. But uh, other than that, there's not been a lot of a lot of major costs associated with it. Even though I am in consider am consideration considering uh, because we are located in the lower level of the uh, Germantown Historic Society, um, which is um, you know that's a very old building. So I am um, looking into uh, getting air purifiers just to keep the room clear, clean. Uh, but uh, um, that hasn't happened yet. But I am looking into making that happen. Thank you. Um, so as you were preparing to reopen and as you reopened, uh, do you have any suggestions for how to market and promote a site's reopening responsibly and specifically how we can help make visitors feel safe? This is more in the marketing side. How, how did you, actually, you might want to start just by sharing what you did to announce your reopening and what kind of messaging you used. When we initially reopened, um, we announced really only through social media. And this was intentionally. Um, we kind of slow rolled into this. And um, I felt that that was really the responsible thing to do. You know, I, we did not know what to expect. So we actually had an abundance of staff on site that day, just in case. Um, so our, we really are, plus, you know, our, our revenue is, is way, way down. So we don't have the marketing budget. We've had to, or we're just in our second reiteration of our budget now um, so that we've had to shrink our expenses. So we've really relied on um, digital communication via social media, our email newsletter and the website. Uh, Nancy, do you have any anything to share about how you announced your reopening? I, I would say the same as Beth. We did um, basically through social media and we also rolled it out 
we're rolling it out very slowly um, just to test the waters and see how things go. Um, same thing. And uh, so I, it's been good. I mean, you know, we, we have a lot of people on the property and uh, we have a lot of people for our digital programming. So we're crossing our fingers and that we'll just have just the right amount for when we're ready to open the building. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> and Gwen, uh, how about your experience with marketing and promoting the reopening? Um, well, yeah, we did some marketing um, via social media um, as well as, you know, announcing on our uh, website that, that we would be opening. But the, most of our marketing is done via, um, you know, um, email, social media, um, and, and the website. But we haven't, you know, haven't ventured out to doing anything other than that. Okay, how, what has the audience response been as you've been talking to visitors? Um, was anybody saying this, what their thoughts and experiences were about coming out again as visitors to historic sites? Uh, we've got like three calls today alone of people who want to tour again. So I think people are now feeling more comfortable and are feeling like they want to get out and see things again. So, um, and we did not have that earlier. So I think it's people's perceptions are beginning to change and they want to get out. And I think they, the more places they go and they're, they've been safe, I think they feel more comfortable mm -hmm. going places. That makes sense. Uh, Cheryl, is there anything that, uh, if you were to, to speak to visitors considering visiting historic sites, what would you um, say to them? What kind of advice or information would you say? I mean, I would say, you know, to look for places that, I mean, firstly are outside or where there are things that you can do outside, that's gonna be a great choice. Um, and then to look for places that look like they're paying attention. So if you go to a site and you see signage saying, please wear a mask, please don't come in if you're sick. If you see that the place is set up so that there is enough space you know, between where you would be and where other would, people would be, that's a good sign. You know, I mean, I think we're all about ready to do something other than sitting in our houses some of the time. So it's nice to have these options. Um, and, and I think people also need to have, a, um, have the comfort to say, you know what, this isn't working for me, I'll come back um, if they get somewhere and they're not comfortable with what they see. But I think, you know, from, from the things being talked about today, I think most people are going to arrive at sites and see what they need to see to feel comfortable. Um, and then finally, the last prepared question I have before we open it up to everybody else. Uh, for Nancy, Beth, and Gwen, um, you already mentioned some of this. Uh, have you related current events, specifically the pandemic and the Black Lives Matter movement to your site's interpretations and programming? And how has that gone and what has the audience response been like so far? I'll go first. I, uh, uh, we actually were prompted to open um, because of the interest in people wanting to come to our museum to learn or at least initially to learn about slavery. But when they, uh, when we finished the tour, they actually learned more about race, racism and race relations. Um, many of our visitors came following or were, became interested following the uh, George Floyd killing. It just seemed to just um, set a fire on uh, people who realized that maybe we need to do something or maybe we need to know more about you know racism and, and slavery and all things related to it, and yes, we do in fact uh, um, uh, parallel the current events with uh, past historic events. We actually have um, exhibit that um, has photos of lynchings um, during and post slavery, and we compare it to. Uh, the killings of black people uh, by uh, police officers today. It's uh, very, uh, um, it gets people's attention, but more importantly, it gets people to talk and have open and honest conversations about 
race relations. In fact, one of my uh, visitors, several of my visitors have said, this is the first time that they've ever, and, and these were white people, quite frankly, that they've ever felt comfortable talking about racism in the open with, you know, people other than perhaps their family members. Um, one even said that it has, uh, lest we forget the slavery museum has become a safe place to have uh, open and honest conversations about uh, racism. So we're really proud of that fact. Um, so yes, to answer your question, the answer is absolutely yes. We very much um, bring to the attention of what the Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Movement, Matters Movement uh, exists, why it exists, um, and why uh, saying all lives matter uh, doesn't take away from the fact that, of course, all lives matter but we need to focus on the lives that seem more in jeopardy uh, presently, and that is black and brown lives. Um, I don't have to tell anybody because they see for themselves in the news when they watch the news uh, on television or, or see it on the, on the internet or, or, or the newspapers. So people come there, like I said, um, wanting to understand more about slavery, but they leave having a better understanding about how racism affects our community today and how slavery is the root cause, root cause of slavery and how we need to deal with that and learn that this is a part of American history, not black history. And my visitors always leave feeling very uh, informed. And, um, and as a, a matter of fact, they give us, uh, uh, they refer our other people to us. So we've had sometimes repeat visits as well as people who have given us referrals. So we think we're doing something that's needed and something that is, we feel we're on the right track. Thank you. Um, Nancy or Beth, have you had any experience um, incorporating either the pandemic or the Black Lives Matter movement uh, into your interpretations and programming? That earlier, you know, Clifton is always, at least for the last 15 years, you've know, been studying its enslavement history and um, those of its workers. Uh, so we just felt that it was a good thing to put that out front on our fence so that everybody would know that that is something that we've been concerned with and that uh, we support the Black Lives Matter movement uh, more than just saying a slogan by putting um, the exhibit out. And I would say that 99% of the response has been very, very positive. Um, and uh, I think, you know, putting uh, the exhibit is basically the biographies of those who worked here and were enslaved here. Um, and, I, you know, trying to put, uh, express the humanity of those who were here. Um, and who's most about lives, you know, we don't know a whole lot about, but we'll tell you what we do know. Um, but yeah, I think it's been very positive, the response. Um, and we'll continue to um, do more of this. Um, and in our women's exhibit, this, it's the same where we have both, uh, you know, we're featuring the lives of both the family of the two women, as well as those who, women who worked here and we're enslaved here. Um, so that's all that I have for the prepared questions. Uh, I did want to bring up a question that I saw in chat that I think is very important. Uh, and Cheryl, you might have something um, to, to share about this. Are there special considerations for special needs visitors? Uh, for example, autistic children and adults, uh, some special needs Private schools did their summer programs in person in August. Have there been inquiries for special needs groups? Uh, masks can awful, oft, often be an issue for special needs individuals. So accessibility, I know, is always an issue, especially with historic sites that have, um, you know, just practical concerns about what they can actually do to make their buildings accessible. Um, now there are additional concerns, especially with masks and enforcing visitor behavior. Um, Cheryl, is there anything that the City Department of Public Health has um, to advise in terms of uh, how to address special needs questions when it comes to uh, masks and other behavior? 
Sure, and this comes up for multiple groups, right? I mean, some autistic children or autistic adults may not tolerate a mask. Um, there's other people who can't tolerate a mask, people who have breathing problems, people who have claustrophobia. Um, you know, most people can wear a mask. And I think that we all know that most of the people are not wearing masks. It's not because of a medical problem. But, you know, that said, we don't want to be assuming things when we don't know somebody's individual situation. Um, people who, for medical reasons, can't wear a mask can often wear a face shield. Um, and that's another great option to offer. If you are keeping masks around for people, it might be useful to keep a, a couple of face shields. Most people prefer the mask. It's just kind of easier and smaller. But a face shield, which it needs to come all the way back to the front of the ears and down below the chin to be effective, it doesn't, um, you know, it, it's not quite as close fitting, right? So if you have any sense of I can't breathe in a mask, it's going to get rid of that problem for you. And for people who are, uh, who are deaf and who lip read, um, and obviously the problem is not just for them, but for whoever they're with, face shields are a nice option there because you can still see the person's face. And again, for people with autism or other kinds of mental health disorders where the close fittingness of the mask may really bother them, face shields are another option. So the other thing to think about um, for, for people who really just don't want to wear a mask or can't wear a mask is are, are there outdoor parts of your facility where they can comfortably go and not wear a mask and not be putting other people at risk? So, um, you know, I think all of those are good things to explore. In the governor's order on masks, it does say that people don't have to show proof that they have a medical condition that stops them from wearing the mask. They can just say that they have it. But I think trying to guide people who are not able to wear a mask to another option that does protect other people is a useful thing to do. Thank you. Um, so I do want to take the rest of the time here. We technically only have five more minutes, but I do know some of our panelists are able to stay a little bit later. So we're going to keep this panel open until 515. Any of our panelists who have to go, um, uh, obviously you're not expected to stay. Uh, but we have time to at least take one or two questions before the official end. Uh, so in order to ask a question, this is for attendees, at the bottom of your screen, there is a toolbar. If you hit participants, that opens a new window. And in that window, you'll see a raise hand function. If you hit that raise hand function, then that will add you to the queue to ask questions. And we will ask you to unmute to ask your question. So you're welcome to go ahead and do that now. And we'll start um, taking questions. Actually, while we're waiting to see if anybody has questions, some have been submitted through chat. So one question that I have here is, will you be reaching out to any in any special ways to teachers as the school year begins? We were just discussing that um, last week. Um, for We've done an annual homeschool day the last several years, and we're looking at how we might modify that since so many kids are now at school at home um, to make it sort of an outdoor sort of interactive day where we would um, do exclusively like uh, program elements of our typical school programs um, to hit multi age groups. Uh, we've got a big picnic area. We could spread people out at lunch, uh, take limited reservations. So we are looking to um, to reach out that way for in-person programming. And we are also videotaping a lot of our summer educational programs, which will become online resources. Okay, thank you. Um, so I am actually going to now officially wrap it up because uh, Dr. Bedigal does need to leave. I'm not sure if any of our other panelists will have to go. I know some of you said that you can stay. Um, so I just want to take the time before uh, Dr. Betta Gold leaves to thank her and all of our panelists, uh, Gwen, Nancy, Beth, uh, thank you all so much for taking the time to lend your expertise. Um, for any of our participants and attendees that need to leave now as well, we will be sending out a follow-up email with some information and resources, including some of the things mentioned today. 
Um, I'll send that out to everybody who registered. Um, and again, you're more than welcome to learn more about Global Philadelphia by going to globalphiladelphia.org. And also, I welcome any questions directly to me. You can send me a message. Um, I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts on reopening or how Global Philadelphia might be able to help you in promoting um, and assisting as you reopen. Um, so this is the official end to the panel today. Thank you so much to our panelists. We will Thank keep you. this uh, open for another 15 minutes for additional questions from the audience. So thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. I do have to leave, but I've enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gwen. Bye-bye. Bye. OK, so we have Nancy and Beth still with us today um, for another 10, 15 minutes if we have additional questions. So again, if you have a question for our panelists, hit the raise hand, or you can submit a question through chat. Okay, I'm gonna give everyone one more minute. I think we might actually, don't see any raised hands. Again, send a question through chat if you're having any issues finding the raise hand function or anything like that. Yeah, we had questions about uh, Independence National Historical Park. Um, that is something that we can investigate a little bit further. I've been hearing some things from um, from Independence National Historical Park as far as their plans go, but I'm not sure what the most up to date information is. So I can look into that and we'll send that along with our follow up email. I don't know who asked that question, but I did a webinar through the Park Service, um, and I emailed you, Melissa, the link to their resource on housekeeping, which um, was, was very helpful. We, we utilized that when kind of figuring out what our clean, cleaning protocol is going to be. Yes, and that link, thank you for sharing that. That link will be sent out in the email to everyone who registered. Um, I do have one other question. Uh, so, so you mentioned, you each mentioned a little bit about virtual programming. Um, what exactly have you developed and uh, what has the response been to the virtual programming that you've developed? Um, well, we've uh, done, uh, I think the most interesting thing we did was we usually do a play in the house in the summer. And so we took that, uh, a film we had done a few years ago and then got the uh, actors and director together uh, and we had a uh, virtual uh, meeting with the actors and the director as well as showing uh, part of the film which is about uh, um, enslavement at Clifton and um, it was very well received it, it really, uh, we sold out, we had 150 sign up um, and the discussion afterwards with the actors and the director were just, was really wonderful. Um, and then right now we're working on doing, uh, having a, a website that's associated with our women's exhibit in which we will have um, a exhibit that's more of a static exhibit that relates to each of the artifacts, uh, an exhibit that one on um, uh, link for each um, individual uh, woman. And that will have a, a tour of the room in which she's associated with, as well as a little video about her, as well as the typical exhibit panels. Um, so there'll be like four parts to it. Um, and that was funded through the Pennsylvania Humanities Council. Um, and then we, we've done, you know, Zoom meetings with roundtables and discussions and sort of the typical uh, types of uh, virtual programming. But uh, all of ours has been very well received. Great. I also want to encourage uh, anybody who operates a historic site uh, to send Global Philadelphia information. Um, I did mention before, 
We really like to be able to promote um, the virtual programming, especially as we're working. We, we work with a lot of schools and teachers and that's, that sort of programming is always really helpful, especially since they're going to be the district is going to be starting the school year online. Um, and obviously families are looking for things to do and virtual tours and programming and learning more about their own city is, is just a fantastic way to uh, to at least virtually get out of the house. Um, and uh, Beth, do you have anything to say about um, what you've been doing and pivoting a little our, bit? Our online programming has been is, has been limited at, to date. We um, sort of activated our blog space on our website uh, early on and rolled out an, uh, um, an activity that related to our education programs or to a visit here um, every week during um, prior to our reopening. And we're really thinking about going forward because obviously schools are not gonna be visiting this year or probably next year, um, how we're going to um, share programming without losing the possibility of the revenue stream um, when things back, open back up. So we really do not have a lot of uh, bu budget for the technology involved. So we're sort of figuring it out as we go along uh, on a shoestring. Yeah. Um, so this is going to be the final opportunity to anybody who is uh, still in the audience right now. Um, if you have any questions, or even if you want to share something about your own experience, if you operate a site, um, or if you've been a visitor to a site um, and actually participated in something that you um, felt was a, a powerful way of, of, um, of sharing virtually or safely. Um, okay. I'm scrolling through really quickly just to make sure that I'm not missing any questions from chat, but I think that about wraps it up. Okay. Uh, so thank you again to uh, Nancy and Beth, and of course to Cher Cheryl Bettigal and uh, Gwen Ragsdale. Um, again, if you joined late or didn't hear um, who our panelists were or where they were from, uh, we had Dr. Cheryl Bettigal from the city's Department of Public Health. Uh, we had Nancy Van Dolsen from Cliveden, um, who is still with us right now. We have Beth Beatty from Port Mifflin, also still with us. And earlier we also had Gwen Ragsdale from the Lest We Forget Museum of Slavery. Uh, all three of those sites are open. I encourage you to check them out. Uh, support your local historic sites, learn more about your city. And if again, if you operate a historic site, um, please get in touch with Global Philadelphia. We'd love to hear about what you're doing and we'd love to promote um, your site to visitors, whether it's virtual or in person. Um, there will be a follow-up email to everyone who registered. So I will be sharing a lot of the information that we went through today. Um, so thank you. I'm gonna conclude everything now and have a great day. Stay safe, everybody.